Five people have been arrested and charged with breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in the middle of the night. Police confiscated extensive photographic and electronic eavesdropping gear. I want it implemented on a thievery basis. I want it implemented on a thievery basis. God damn it, get in and get those files. We are going to use any means. Within a week after the Watergate arrests, Woodward and Bernstein already realized that Watergate was no ordinary burglary, and they started digging. We couldn't find out who worked for the re-election committee. It, it was like a top secret. You really, you knew John Mitchell was the chairman, you knew a couple other names, but beyond that, you couldn't find out. Carl got the uh, list of people who worked there, and we couldn't call them at their offices. We started visiting these people at night in their homes. Bob and I were good friends. I know how hard he worked on it. He worked on it all the time. He, he worked on it at night. He knocked on doors at night. It was 24-7 for both Carl and Bob, and he kept telling me over and over, do not let them take this story away from you. Hold on to this story. Nine days after the Watergate arrests, White House Chief of Staff Bob Haldeman was nervous about whether the cover-up would hold, particularly for John Mitchell. But Nixon was truly loyal to Mitchell and refused to make him the fall guy. So Mitchell pulls out, so still the former attorney general, your former campaign manager. So Mitchell pulls out, so he's still the former attorney general and the former campaign manager. They're not going to let up on him just because he isn't the manager now. The only way you can do that is to hang him on it and say, well, yeah, he did it. That's why we have to get rid of him. I can't do that to him. I'd rather shit lose the election. Well, you can't do that. He won't let you do that. He'll pull the plug on himself. No, no. He was supposed to do everything he could to find out what was going on. But apparently, with our limited resources, they use the same people for a wide range of things. So you got cross ties. If these guys were only on this thing, you could cut them loose and sink them without a trace. Tying these people to those and this, well, that is a problem because it shows they were political. Yeah. You're right. John Mitchell resigned today as the head of President Nixon's re-election campaign committee. Some Democrats maintain that the burglary of their headquarters carried out by, among others, a member of Mitchell's staff may have been a factor. Most White House and creep officials went along with the cover-up. And just to make sure, whenever they were questioned by the FBI, a White House lawyer would be watching. I was assigned to interview John Magruder. This was at the White House. The White House attorney in back of me and started interviewing him. Now, I don't have any information. I don't know anything about this. And then he starts dribbling out some stuff. I'm taking notes. And all of a sudden, I felt something in the back of me. And here was the White House lawyer is going like this, looking at my notes. I said, well, Mr. Magruder, if you don't tell me now what your involvement was or is in this case, you're going to have to tell the grand jury. I said, save yourself the trip. But he wouldn't do it. You could tell that he was lying. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. Magruder took me to lunch and uh, said, you know, the amount of money we authorized for Gordon Liddy is a problem. We can't tell people that it was that much, so you and I need to tell them a different number. And uh, I was a little shocked by this, so I said, well, Jeb, I have no intention of perjuring myself. And he said, you may have to. But Hugh Sloan was an honest man, and when Creep pressured him to lie, he resigned instead. And soon afterwards, Woodward and Bernstein found him. A lot of doors were slammed in our faces, but very quickly I found myself on the doorstep of the person called the bookkeeper. It turned out that the bookkeeper was the assistant to the treasurer of the Committee for the Re-election of the President, a man named Hugh Sloan. They were young guys just starting out, and they made the appeal, okay, you can't talk to us publicly, but let's talk about, can't you help us understand how a campaign works? Can't we talk on background? Uh, uh, that type of approach, and they were quite good at it. He started uh, explaining that there were these large disbursements to people like Gordon Liddy, 
and that there was this secret cash fund and there were five people who had control of it. It turned out that John Mitchell was one of the people who could authorize disbursements of that fund. The Watergate bugging had been funded with knowledge of the campaign manager while he was the chief law enforcement officer of the country. I had a number for Mitchell, and I got him on the phone, and I said, Mr. Mitchell, there's a story in a Morris paper I want to read to you that Bob Woodward and myself have written and get your response. And I got as far as John N. Mitchell, while Attorney General of the United States, had controlled a secret fund. And Mr. Mitchell said, Jesus, just like that. Got to the end of the first paragraph, and Mitchell said, Jesus Christ, all that crap you're putting it in the paper, it's already been denied. If you print that, Katie Graham is going to get her tit caught in a big, fat ringer. And uh, there was a pause, and then he said, and, and when this campaign is over, we're going to do a little story on you two boys. And he hung the phone up. And I can tell you that to this day, it's the most chilling moment I think I've ever had as a reporter because he meant it. But Bernstein didn't back off, and crucially, neither did Ben Bradley, the Washington Post's editor, or Catherine Graham, the Post's owner and publisher. So I called Ben Bradley up after this conversation with Mitchell, and I told him what Mitchell had said, and Bradley said, you really said that? Do you have good notes? And I said, yeah, I read him back my notes. He said, put it all in a paper, but leave her tit out. <laughs> and that's exactly what Bernstein did. And the next morning, Mrs. Graham came down to my desk and said, Carl, do you have any more messages for me? Woodward, Bernstein, and the Post kept pushing, seemingly without interference. But unknown to them, Nixon and the White House were already plotting to cripple them. What are you going to do about the Washington Post? What are you going to do about the Washington Post? Well, we can't do a thing before the election. The White House has got to do something. What do you think? Well, you buy the stock. Well, she's got two classes of stock. 70% of the voting powers are in stock she alone holds. Can't you screw her on a television license? Oh, yes. How? Just not renew it. it. Has to come up for renewal every three years. How do we, how do we do that? You put a group together as a way to get at her. Nixon's new Attorney General Richard Kleindienst made sure that the FBI and the prosecutors limited their investigation to the burglars, Hunt, and Liddy. Kleindienst and his deputy, Henry Peterson, also told the White House everything the investigators did. It's Henry Peterson, the head of the criminal division, who's right on top of the investigation and filling me in with everything that's happening in the investigation, not only the FBI, but the grand jury. Seven people were indicted today. The five who were caught by the police, along with two others, G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, a former consultant for the White House. He was likewise the most thorough, comprehensive <laughs> grand jury presentation that has ever been made. There was no stone that was left unturned. There was no lead or possible witness that wasn't followed up. Sources here at the Justice Department say the investigation by both the FBI and the grand jury is over. There is no evidence, they insist, that anyone else was involved. Later that day, Nixon summoned John Dean to the Oval Office. The 1972 election was still 54 days away, but Nixon was pleased with the cover-up. In fact, he was already planning more attacks on enemies, including the Washington Post and its attorney, Edward Bennett Williams. Three months ago, I would have had difficulty predicting where we'd be today. I think I can say that 54 days from now, that. Not a thing will come crashing down. Well, the whole thing is a can of worms. A lot of this stuff went on, but the way you've handled it, it seems to me, has been very skillful. Putting your fingers in the dikes every time that leaks have sprung, uh, don't worry. I won't want to be on the other side right now. I won't want to be in Edward Bennett Williams' position after this election. No. No, because afterwards, that's the guy. Now we're going after him. That's the guy we got to ruin. He's an attorney for the Washington Post. I think we're going to fix the son of a bitch. We got him. Absolutely. Well, um, along that line, 
one of the things I've tried to do is keep notes on people who are less than our friends. I want the most comprehensive notes on all of those that have tried to do us in. We haven't used the power in the first four years. We haven't used the Bureau. We haven't used the Justice Department. But things are going to change now. That's an exciting prospect. Nixon administration officials would take reporters aside and say, I hope you're not buying this Watergate bullshit. You know, the Post is way out on a limb here. I don't respect the type of journalism, the shabby journalism that is being practiced by the Washington Post. At CBS News, in the beginning, alone among the television networks, took the attitude, we should take it to air with full credit and say, in today's news, worth noting, the Washington Post is reporting thus and such. They were back-channel calls to William S. Paley, who basically owned the company, was a Republican, had been a big Nixon supporter, pressure on him to shut these news guys up. And to his everlasting credit, for the most part, he stonewalled them. The White House, I believe it was Charles Colson, called Paley and squeezed Mr. Paley, who turned around and squeezed the news division. Now, it was pretty bold and uh, courageous of the then president of CBS News to stand up to Mr. Paley. The pressure was on. High White House officials came to one case, the bureau chief, and another case to the head of the news division, suggesting that I be relieved as White House chief correspondent. In fact, John Ehrlichman once said to the president of the news division, maybe you could send this guy rather back to Texas. They targeted Dan. Dan became the bete noir. One of the, there's a, Nixon had an enemies list and then there was Dan Rather. He was enemy number one. I think one of the reasons that I admired Dan so much is that I did know he was coming under pressure and he stood up to it. He didn't withdraw, he didn't change what he wanted to say night after night on the White House lawn. I can remember coming home to my wife and I told her, you know, it's one of those times in life that professionally, both CBS News and we, our little selves here family, we've got everything on the line. If any or all of what is alleged to have been going on is true, how high up in the White House does it go? And is the president himself involved? On September 28, 1972, Carl Bernstein got a phone call that led him to a lawyer and low-level government official named Donald Segretti. I was in the office. I get this call from somebody who says he has a friend who had been approached in a rather strange way to go to work for the Nixon re-election committee to try and maybe do some dirty tricks. And I was given the guy's name, which was Alex Shipley. And he told me this story of how he and others had been approached by a guy named Donald Segretti, who said he was working on behalf of the Nixon campaign to try to sabotage campaign events. We have this name Segretti, we got his credit card records and his telephone records. And, How'd you uh, do that? <laughs> Uh, I, I had a source at the telephone company, and, uh, and uh, I can't remember how. Maybe Bob got the American Express records. Maybe I did. I can't remember. That couldn't happen these days. It'd be pretty tough. I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. Segretti flew cross-country to more than 17 states, setting up a nationwide network of spies and saboteurs. He recruited more than 50 operatives who helped him pull his pranks, some benign, others clear violations of law. The reports by the Washington Post and Time magazine named the president's appointment secretary, Dwight Chapin, as a contact man for the operation. The other, named by the Post, is Herbert Kalmbach, the president's personal lawyer. What's the situation on Segretti? Segretti, uh, just so you know, is incommunicado. But he calls John Dean from a public phone and calls onto a line that's not traceable every day around noon. Well, this is why we got the man we got. We get him paid outside, get him completely away from the place. I just think we got him brazen it through. Uh, meanwhile, Kalmbach, what's he have to say? Kalmbach doesn't have to say a goddamn thing. I know that. 
It's a question whether if the lawyer for the president is involved in putting up the money, that's a bad story. Right. Has anybody talked to Segretti, Don Segretti, to find out whether such an well, espionage squad uh, existed? I really don't know. In the Justice Department? Uh, don't you I, think? Should uh, they? Well, I don't know if they should or not. When Woodward and Bernstein dug into Segretti's dirty tricks operation, they quickly realized that it was just one part of something much larger. Finally, Watergate made sense that this break-in was not an isolated incident, but it was part of a vast campaign of political espionage and sabotage to undermine the Democrats and the election itself. This was an effort to say, we're going to pick who Nixon runs against to make sure he wins. It worked. And I think people who worked in the campaign will tell you that it worked. Nixon's efforts to sabotage the election had started a year earlier. First, Colson, Dean, Haldeman, and others created lists of opponents and discussed how to attack them. For example, in this 1971 memo by John Dean. Then Nixon, thinking ahead to the election, started to focus on potential Democratic opponents, especially the Democratic front runner, Maine Senator Edmund Muskie. John, we have the power, but are we using it to investigate, you know, contribute us to uh, Humphrey, Muskie, Jews who are stealing. I don't know. We have a new man over there. You mean an IRS? Yeah, their tax returns. Are we looking into Muskie's return? No, we haven't. Teddy Kennedy, the Kennedys, shouldn't they be investigated? IRS-wise, I don't know. Teddy, we are covering personally. Well, what about Muskie? This wasn't just another one of Nixon's rants. Again and again over the following months, Nixon pressured his staff to attack the Democrats. Now here's the point. Bob, please get me the names of the Jews. The big Jewish contributors to the Democrats. Could we please investigate some of the cocksuckers? IRS is going after Billy Graham. I just don't know whether we're being as rough. I've often been asked what it feels like to be the front runner. Well, the one sensation that I feel most of all, almost every day, is a twitching between my shoulder blades. <laughs> because I know I'm the target. Muskie had no idea how right he was. By early 1972, the White House, Creep, and Donald Segretti were mounting numerous and increasingly serious covert operations against him. They had Muskie's chauffeur on the payroll. One of his jobs was to take documents from Muskie's Senate office to Muskie's campaign headquarters. The chauffeur was paid by the Nixon campaign to make copies of those documents. And so the Nixon campaign had total transparency of what Muskie was doing. Strategy memos, the schedule, copies of everything. Newspapers started publishing stories that attacked his wife. I think they rattled Muskie. Uh, one of the operations was this Canuck letter. Since his earliest campaigns, Nixon had used smear tactics. But in 1972, he also used what we now call fake news, and he used it very effectively. Democratic Senator Edmund Muskie today denounced William Loeb, the conservative publisher of the Manchester, New Hampshire Union leader, as a liar and a gutless coward. What infuriated Muskie was Loeb's publication yesterday of a letter from a man in Florida who claimed he had overheard Muskie laugh at the use of the word Canuck, a reference to Americans of French descent. Both the attacks on Muskie's wife and the Canuck letter were fake, but their effects were very real. First, to say to Mr. Loeb, who is the publisher of this paper, that he has lied about me by attacking me, by attacking my wife. He has proved himself to be a gutless coward. Talking more about the incident, he suddenly became emotional and found it difficult to continue. Maybe I said all I should on it. 
It's fortunate for him he's not on this platform beside me. A good woman. He got very emotional and he cried. And a lot of people thought that that was pivotal in the downfall of Muskie. Muskie had a psychological collapse. On television, we watched Edmund Muskie choking back tears. Emotional display carries a connotation of incomplete self-control. Not a good impression for a potential chief executive to create. Muskie was forced to drop out of the race in April. And in July, the Democrats nominated liberal Senator George McGovern as their candidate to oppose Nixon. The senator from South Dakota and the next president of the United States, George McGovern. One of Nixon's key aides, Pat Buchanan, thought it was just great they got George McGovern to run against, who was much more uh, left-wing. I was doing then, at Nixon's request, the in-depth analysis of his potential adversaries in 72, foremost among which was Muskie. And I'd already done the analysis of Muskie. And I didn't do McGovern because I said in a memo, uh, we have not been, lived so good a life that divine providence is going to reward us with George McGovern as an opponent. But divine providence had nothing to do with it. And the White House didn't stop, even after they had knocked Muskie out of the race. George McGovern replaced Muskie as the likely presidential candidate. They attempted to break into McGovern headquarters several times and to bug McGovern headquarters and failed there as well. This is a story that I think is not yet well known in many parts of the country. But the evidence is very strong that at least 50 people, and perhaps more than that, have been hired to do some of the shabbiest undercover operations in the history of American politics. And I remember the thing that surprised me most was all of this important information was coming out and it seemed to have no impact on the public. This was no accident. For years, Nixon had been preparing a brilliant strategy that combined election year politics and global diplomacy. It succeeded and it also totally overwhelmed media coverage of Watergate. Ironically, some of Nixon's motives and goals were deeply idealistic. We're in a situation at the present time, it will be the last time the United States can create conditions which can lead to peace for perhaps 25 years. The problem we have with the Russians and the Chinese, they believe in one thing, we believe in another. But if you start talks with that in mind, there is a chance you can find areas where you live and let live. The only thing I would give to the other side is that any man, no matter how savage, probably does think of young people, the kids. And they know, as we know, that in war, it would be mass incineration. But however noble his goals, Nixon's strategy and timing were ruthlessly political with every major action planned for the election year. Step one, in February 1972, the opening to communist China, complete with panda bears, table tennis matches, and state visits. First American president ever to do so steps onto Chinese soil. Once Nixon opened dialogue with China, he moved to step two, using his new relationship with China as leverage to get a nuclear weapons treaty with the Soviet Union. These agreements mean a first step in reducing the danger of war in the world and increasing the chances of peace. But the crown jewel of Nixon's strategy was Vietnam. Nixon intensified the bombing of Vietnam so he could start withdrawing troops, timed perfectly for the 1972 election. The president has decided to continue our withdrawal program to an authorized level of 27,000 by December 1st, 1972. The troop withdrawals reduced not only U.S. casualties, but also draft levels, enabling Nixon to announce an end to the draft. This was enormously popular with 18 and 19-year-olds reaching draft age, so Nixon also announced that he would lower the voting age from 21 to 18. President Nixon is making a strong bid for the support of the 11 million young voters who will be casting their first ballots in November. The final touch would be a Vietnam peace agreement. 
Nixon and Kissinger needed to time it so that the agreement would be announced before the election, but that South Vietnam wouldn't collapse until after, so that the Doves couldn't accuse them of having prolonged the war for nothing. The real question is whether we settle at a cost of destroying the uh, South Vietnamese. The advantage to settle now is you assure a hell of a landslide. You have a mandate. The question is, how can we maneuver so it will look like a settlement by election day? If we can get there, then we can screw them after election day if necessary. And this, this I think could finish the destruction of Montgomery. Oh, yes. I'm just not sure the South can survive in any of it. The Northerners have more stamina. How the hell they've taken what they have, I don't know. The Doves should not be able to say in October that what you did they would have done in 69 and saved 20,000 lives. Yeah. Nixon's strategy worked. The North Vietnamese went along with Kissinger's proposal, betting correctly that once the Americans were gone, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong could easily conquer South Vietnam. And so, just 10 days before the 1972 election, Henry Kissinger called a press conference that guaranteed Nixon's landslide victory. We believe that peace is at hand. We believe that by far the longest part of the road has been traversed. Two years after America's withdrawal, South Vietnam collapsed. But in 1972, the agreement made Nixon unbeatable. Nothing else mattered, certainly not Watergate. The president leads McGovern by 26 points in the Gallup. President Nixon is well on the way toward uh, the predicted landslide re-election. Well, in Washington, President Nixon's number one domestic affairs advisor is John Ehrlichman, and David Shoemaker is with him now. Uh, Howard, he feels too good. I'm going to ask him whatever happened to Watergate. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Apparently nothing. <laughs> but while the cover-up had temporarily kept the lid on, Watergate just wouldn't go away. There had already been rumors of payoffs to the Watergate burglars, and suddenly they weren't just rumors anymore. On the 8th of December, this plane crashed near Chicago's Midway Airport. One of those who died in the crash was the wife of E. Howard Hunt. In Mrs. Hunt's purse, $100, $100 bills were found, and there has been subsequent testimony that the cash may have been hush money supplied by the committee to re-elect the president. Do they have any reading yet on the traceability of the $10,000? Uh, no. Uh, Dean spent most of the weekend on that. Uh, uh, the bills are still in the hands of the Chicago police to be turned over to Hunt today. So, well, until then, John doesn't know whether it's traceable money or not. He doesn't think it is. Or something could just be said. The problem is exactly that. Uh, if you reopen it, you raise more questions than you answer, and you bring the thing back up to public attention. The thing that bothers me is Segretti and the other stuff like that tends to be tied to Watergate. Oh, well, let's face it, we all know who should have handled this. God damn it, it was Mitchell. And he wasn't handling it. Now, there is a way to do this, and that is to dump Mitchell on this thing and say, uh... I'd dump him. It would kill him financially. Mitchell has a serious problem with his wife. He was unable to watch the campaign, and as a result, underlings did things without his knowledge. And that really dumps on Magruder. The minute you dump on Mitchell by saying he didn't watch the underlings, the underlings are going to produce their diaries and show that Mitchell was in 18 meetings where this was discussed, approved, authorized, financed. Still tense about Watergate, but also emboldened by Nixon's re-election, the White House intensified its pressure on the Washington Post. Right after the election, the pressure got very, very tough. The real threat was the challenge to, to our television, television station licenses, which were up for renewal in Florida. Almost all of them were obviously politically motivated, mostly by committee to reelect the president people. A group headed by President Nixon's Florida fundraiser announced Tuesday that it will file a rival application for the license of the television station WJXT, now held by a syndicate of the Washington Post Company. Isn't that too bad? Post will spend a fortune. The only thing that was unfortunate on Watergate 
was Segretti. Aldwin slipped there. That kind of operation should be on the outside. But despite enormous pressure, Catherine Graham and the Washington Post didn't bend an inch. I was in the newsroom, and I got a call from the guard down on 15th Street that there was a guy with a subpoena for me, Woodward, our notes. And uh, should he let him upstairs? And I said, no, keep him down there. And then I called Ben Bradley, the editor. Bradley said, uh, give me a minute, I'll, and I'll call you right back. Call back about five minutes later. And he said, all right, first you get out of the office for the afternoon. And I talked to Catherine, and she says, they're not your notes. They're her notes. And if anybody's going to go to jail, it's going to be her. I still, I, I get choked up talking about it. Um, Nixon faced two looming threats. His first problem was the Senate, which was still under Democratic control despite Nixon's landslide victory. The Senate tonight voted 77 to nothing to establish a select committee to investigate alleged political espionage in last year's election campaign. That includes the Watergate bugging case. The committee will be headed by North Carolina Democrat Sam Irvin. The second problem Nixon faced was the burglar's trial. And now the criminal trial begins in the rarely used ceremonial courtroom, the biggest available. At least temporarily, the burglars were under control through payoffs and the prosecutors were controlled by Kleindienst and the White House. But there was one man at the trial who wasn't under control, the judge. Judge John J. Sirica was a conservative Republican and a Nixon supporter, but he also believed in the law, and he was about to become a big problem. Judge Sirica, boy, he was something. I think he was a stunningly honest man, and he was outraged. This isn't right. This isn't the way things are done. They've crossed a line. I remember talking to Judge Sirica. We chatted off the record, and he said, you know, I've got this courtroom case where the U.S. attorney says Gordon Liddy is the mastermind, and I have a subscription to the Washington Post, and I've read all of these stories saying Magruder, Mitchell, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, White House involvement, and so forth. He said the disconnect is so great. The Justice Department, through Peterson and the prosecutors, became part of the cover-up. They had a fair amount of the same information that we were uncovering. We didn't know that at the time. But they were ordered to only prosecute the Watergate burglary itself. They had the information on Segretti. We didn't even know it at the time. That they did. Finally, at some point in there, we went to them and said, you know, and said, oh, yeah, we know all about that. In an extraordinary statement from the bench, a federal judge today made clear that he believes the whole truth did not emerge in the trial of the Watergate case. Sirica disclosed he's given prosecutor Earl Silbert a secret list of persons, some of them never questioned, who should be called before the grand jury. Silbert later indicated to CBS News the prosecution is not planning to renew its investigation. After the burglars were found guilty, Sirica threatened them with long prison sentences unless they agreed to talk. This gravely endangered the cover-up, as Nixon immediately realized. A minute on Watergate. What the hell is the strategy now? The judge, his conduct is shocking. What's he bucking for? An appointment with the Democrats? No, no. Circa is a, is a tough, hard-boiled law and order judge. I know him pretty well. The only thing I can figure is this case just got under his craw for some reason. After the election, Nixon learns that Holloman and Ehrlichman know everything they know, basically through me. So Nixon tells Ehrlichman, I'm going to have Dean report directly to me on Watergate. A 35-year Sentence them with no weapons, right? No injuries? That's just ridiculous. One of these blacks holds up a store with a goddamn gun. They give him two years of probation after six months. And they let him out on bond. Hunt made the bond. Everybody else is in jail. What the hell do they expect? They expect clemency within a reasonable time? They think they do. And what would you advise on that? It's one of those things we'll have to watch very closely. You couldn't do it, say, in six months? No. 
This may become so political. Jesus Christ. The main thing is the isolation of the president from this. Absolutely. Because that, fortunately, is totally true. I know that, sir. But the committee is after the White House. Haldeman or Colson, Ehrlichman, or possibly Dean. John Dean was right to be worried because the cover-up was starting to fall apart. The first to name Dean publicly was L. Patrick Gray, who was forced to testify in the Senate to be confirmed as permanent director of the FBI. Gray has revealed that when the FBI was investigating the Watergate bugging case, a White House lawyer, John Dean, sat in on all questioning of White House officials. Kennedy, did Gray object to Dean's presence? Gray, he couldn't remember for sure, but he would have preferred not to have the president's counsel there. Byrd recalling that Gray testified that FBI agents asked White House counsel John Dean if Watergate suspect E. Howard Hunt had an office in the White House, and that Dean said he would have to check whether or not Mr. Hunt had an office there and would ascertain that. Byrd asked, when was that? Replied Gray, June 22nd. But that, Byrd pointed out, was three days after Dean had had material from Hunt's office moved to his own office. Said Byrd, he lied to the agent, didn't he? Gray, I would have to say, looking back on it now, I would have to conclude that that probably is correct. Byrd, yet on yesterday, you said you would continue to send files to Dean if he requests them. Gray, you have got to realize I am the head of a bureau in the executive branch of government. I've got to take orders from somebody. That element of ubiquity about Mr. John Dean, he's everywhere at all times in connection with this Watergate investigation. Dean's involvement with the FBI inquiry has added to Democratic suspicions that Gray was put under White House pressure in the Watergate investigation. They want to call the president's counsel as a witness. Even one Republican agreed today this may be necessary to assure Gray's confirmation. The White House has already said that Dean will not testify. But the Senate threatened not to confirm Gray unless the newly formed Senate Watergate committee was allowed to question Dean and other White House officials. If the Gray nomination depends on a satisfactory uh, outcome of the Watergate investigation, uh, that in turn presumably depends on various White House staff people appearing before your select committee on the Watergate. Uh, the White House says they won't come. What are you going to do? I'd recommend to the Senate to send the sergeant in arms of the Senate to arrest the uh, White House aide or any other witness that refuses to fail. At the same time, the Watergate burglars were starting to crack under pressure from Judge Sirica, and they were also starting to blackmail the White House. Mr. Hunt, why did you plead? Mr. Hunt will have no comment. March 19th, one of the lawyers from the re-election committee comes directly to my office and with a message the likes of which I had not received before. He said, John, Howard Hunt has a message for you. And it was that if he wasn't given $122,000 yesterday, for all practical purposes, he was going to have some seamy things to say about what he'd done for John Ehrlichman. That was clear, a threat about the Ellsberg break-in. And I just realized this is going to go on forever. It's, there's no ending. If we don't end this cover-up, uh, it's only going to get more complex, not less and there's only one person who can end it, and that's Richard Nixon. Another Watergate burglar, James McCord, was already talking to Judge Sirica, and John Dean knew that if Hunt and McCord talked, it would be fatal for the Nixon White House and for John Dean. On March 21, Dean went to Nixon. I think there's no doubt about the seriousness of the problem. I think there's no doubt about the seriousness of the problem. We have a cancer within close to the presidency. It's growing daily. It compounds itself. It is basically because one, we're being blackmailed. Two, people are going to start perjuring themselves very quickly to protect other people. And there is no assurance that it won't bust. That that won't bust. So let me give you the basic facts. <clears throat> On June 17th, I got the word there'd been this break-in at the Democratic National Committee. You knew who it was. I knew who it was. So I called Liddy. I said, I want to know how this happened. He said, well, I was pushed by Magruder. Magruder's perjured himself. Liddy said 
that if they all got counsel instantly, well, we'll ride this out. Then they started making demands. Attorney's fees. Uh, we don't have money and you're asking us to take this through the election. So arrangements were made through Mitchell, uh, initiating it. I was present that these guys had to be taken care of. Kalmbach was brought in, raised some cash. That's the most troublesome thing, because Bob is involved in that. John is involved in that. I am involved in that. Mitchell is involved in that. And that is an obstruction of justice. The fact that you're taking care of witnesses Now, the blackmail is continuing. Hunt is demanding another hundred and twenty-some thousand dollars, wanted it by close of business yesterday. Hunt has now made a direct threat. Now, the continued blackmail will go on, and it will compound the obstruction of justice situation. It'll cost money. It's dangerous. People here are not pros at this. This is the sort of thing mafia people can do, washing money. We, we just don't know about these things. We're not criminals. That's right. How much money do you need? I would say a million dollars over the next two years. We could get that. You could get a million dollars, and you could get in cash. I know where it could be gotten. Uh-huh. What if it starts breaking and they find a criminal case against a Holdeman, a Dean, a Mitchell, an Ehrlichman? Some people are gonna have to go to jail. You go to jail? That's right. I can't see how a legal case can be made against you. Obstruction of justice. The obstruction of justice, I feel, could be cut off at the pass. Let us suppose that you get the million bucks and you get the proper way to handle it. It would seem to me that would be worthwhile. I was talking to John about this situation. We get the money. There's no problem in that. We can't provide the clemency if you Hunker down and fight. Your view is that's not a viable option. It's a very high risk. Well, John's point is exactly right. Now, the, the erosion now is going to you, and we've got to figure out where to turn it off. At the lowest cost we can, but at whatever cost it takes. We cannot let you be tarnished. It isn't just Hunt. It's uh, Liddy and McCord and uh, the, the Cubans. So Dean finally goes running to Mitchell and said, uh, I've got to have some money. Kambach can't do it anymore and, and shouldn't. Dangerous things are raising the money. <laughs> you can't have a fundraising drive and uh, give everybody certificates and gold pens. The obstruction of justice. See, I hadn't really thought of that. You know, we're all in it. I think up to this point, we had certain choices. But that's gone. 